it says preparing. Oh yeah, it says it's streaming. Cool. So we're just going to hang on a second. Hi, Kim. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, I'm just going to make uh, a few seconds before we dive in because we're going to have lots to say. And I just want to make sure that we're kind of talking. I think we're on there, so that's great. Great to see you. Just to let everybody know who's listening in, I'm not home. I'm looking after uh, a friend's wonderful place here with their three Afghans and their two old collies and my two, so the seven dogs. I'm here on my own. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd just throw that in, Kim, because uh, they're all really quiet at the moment, right? Brilliant. But whether it'll last, I don't know. If I, if I get bombarded with Afghans and collies, we know why. But so far, so good. Great to see you, Kim. Thank you. You um, too. I'm really happy to have a little private chat with you. It's fun. Uh, and I feel really privileged with that because, uh, you know, I have to share you. When we talk before, well, yeah, other times I have to share you. Uh, and um, if anybody hasn't seen our Beyond the Operant chats, um, uh, Kim and I and our friend Kathy, Kathy Murphy, uh, we've been discussing a lot of topics around rethinking the language and the approaches um, and the philosophy around behaviour with some amazing different guests that have come along and joined us. Uh, we've got Michael Shikashio next time, isn't it, Kim? That's going to be a, an absolute corker. So check those out. You can check those out through um, Kim's pages, uh, the Dog Centred Care Group um uh, and they're, they're well worth that to have a look but yeah i've got you all to myself today kim which is a, a real privilege for me so uh we first got together because i wrote a piece called phantom of the operant a couple of years ago now i think mm -hmm. and then somebody tagged you in and uh tagged in your ted talk uh which i watched and absolutely blew me away uh it was so powerful Kim and I thought then, wow, I've got to, I've got to connect with this lady, um, and to give something that just covers so many of the, the, the asks so many fundamental questions in just a fifteen-minute presentation, it was powerful stuff. So um, I'm hoping people who, have lis who are listening in now have, uh, I've shared the presentation along with the, with the links to the talk. I've managed to catch up on that, but if you haven't yet, you must see it. It's a must watch for me. But uh, can you just frame that um, talk a little bit, Kim, and um, how it came about and, and what your kind of vision was for that uh, for that presentation? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking about it. You know, it was um, I'd always kind of had this bucket list fantasy of like, oh, it'd be so cool to do a TED talk someday. But, you know, it's like thinking, how am I going to get an opportunity to do a TED talk? And then they have all these TEDx events, which I actually didn't know about until I was asked to do that one a few years ago. Um, so here at our local UNCA um, college, university, they uh, were inviting a few kind of local figures, I guess, to submit uh, an application or an idea for doing a TED talk. And so, um, of course, I was all over it. I was like, yes, I'll definitely do it. And then it was like, okay, well, what do I say, right? If I actually have a stage like that, and you've got about 15 minutes to share your idea worth spreading, to quote Ted, what would that idea be for me? And um, it's funny because I actually wrote a whole talk without my story in it at first. And, um, and I felt this sense of uh, distance, right, from the content, the speaker, um, just that kind of separation we all conveniently have when we're on a stage, right, of like, oh, I can kind of pontificate what I would like you to know about me and hide the rest of me. And, you know, um, it, it's one of those things that's kind of ironic about people that are doing public speaking is that a lot of us are actually really introverts, you know, and so it, it can be very uncomfortable talking about our private life. But, but the more I got into, um, you know, rewriting it, editing it, et cetera, I realized it just doesn't have the punch of the personal hit. And frankly, it's because it's not my story. It's not the reality of why this means so much to me. And, um, you know, I, I don't resent my past at all. I don't regret it because I think that everything that happens to us, uh, we, we can find opportunities in that that can do more good in the world and we can grow from those things. Um, another freaking growth opportunity is what I heard someone call them, <laughs> you know, whenever we have huge obstacles, they can make us better people, um, not to say that that's always easy and not to say I didn't do a heck of a lot of work to get to the point where I could even talk about it. Um, but 
the palpable, visceral experience of feeling less than under the um, advantage, the power position of another was so much a part of why I, I think I related to dogs. And when I looked at what their experience was under dog training, you know, under our expectations and assumptions and practices that wanted them to comply to our commands and what we wanted of them, um, where they didn't, they weren't supposed to have a voice. I mean, really the model of um, whatever means, right, even if it's positive reinforcement um, of accomplishing compliance to commands, that being the, the standard value system in the world of dog training. Um, you know, I was so completely struck in wanting to work with dogs, but I never wanted to be that to them. And, and every time I felt I had even an accidental hand in manipulating their behavior for someone else's goals, it felt icky. And it reminded me of something I couldn't ignore that I really related to. So when I had the opportunity to say, hey, you know, with all the work I've been doing in my career to bring attention to applied ethology and integrated canine science, it's really impossible to say what I needed to say without also saying, and here's why I get it, right? Here's why this makes so much sense to me with my personal experience. I think, frankly, there's a whole lot of people that even if it wasn't the exact same kind of experience I had, have felt that way, whether by a parent, by culture, um, by a family member, by a spouse. Um, you know, there's so much emotional and psychological abuse that goes on in the name of control and power. And I think that that is an unfortunate reality about the human predicament. Um, and sometimes I even entertain the thought of whether that's something that animals wrestle with that way and whether that's partly the survival, you know, mechanism that uh, social animals feel like they need to employ sometimes. Um, but there's a, there's a level of kind of sickness, I think, that has entered um, humans' engagement of it, nonetheless, whether animals do it or not, uh, where we, we feel so emboldened and entitled to take the power of another and have all of these cultural justifications around it or um, you know, even just family dynamic points of reference justifications around it in our minds. Um, and for me, it was so powerful because I kept something a secret for a long time in my life. And I was so ashamed of having been on the other end of it as if, as if it, you know, the, the success of the power dynamic had made me feel smaller and made me feel like I was less than. And having done the work of the therapy to start to heal those wounds and feel okay about myself, the opportunity, frankly, to share that message with the world was, was kind of the final piece of my own healing. And it was a really terrifying and amazing moment to say, I'm not ashamed of this, you know? And, and frankly, it's, it's part of what made me who I am. And I want to tell others that um, they need to tap into that part of themselves in thinking about dogs and realize that a lot of the normal ways that we interact with and relate to our dogs and the expectations we have are accidentally, if not intentionally, psychologically and emotionally abusive for them. Um, and I think that it's, we've evolved enough as a culture, it's just time to stop tiptoeing around that. And I think that's what was so powerful for me um, when I saw the TED talk for the first time, because, you know, you didn't kind of break us in gently. You didn't do a lot of pleasantries. It was bam. This is my part of my experience. This is what I felt viscerally in that moment. Uh, and that really gets you connected then. It really brings you in. Uh, and then it allows us to have a bit of an opening then to start thinking about the perspectives that you introduced then regarding how we have traditionally viewed our companion dogs and how we train them. And I think when we think about it from a, I, I did a little talk last night actually on the judgments and language around behavior. And it's important to recognize that we all have a belief system that is uh, the brain's way of just trying to create 
some surety about what's going on so it doesn't have to reprocess everything all the time mm -hmm. and uh, um, and part of that is then the brain wants to have that kind of predictability of outcome uh, it creates some biases to protect that belief system and predictability outcome but from that moment on when we have that we then start looking at how then how we judge situations the expectations we put on those judgments and the language that we do and invariably it can lead us to seek to control and coerce and to change behaviors that either have to fit with our belief system or that uh, we think challenge our belief system, we need to change them. Uh, and the reality is that process is very easy. You know, it's not, it's very kind of, in, it's almost reflexive in a way. Yeah. So uh, it's very alluring to have that not I mean, is the right word, but it's very, um, we can see why we've created this structure, the traditional structure around dogs, because it kind of fits all that, right? And especially the dominance model, the dominance model came around for many reasons, as we know, but the reason it's really kind of uh, got quite fixed in is because it fits that, the need to control, coerce, to make a judgment call on what I decide is good or bad. Mm -hmm. And because it's easy, uh, we don't necessarily think about it any differently. And I think having conversations like we've had and, and many other people in the industry have had, uh, they're important for us to step back and think, well, hang on a minute, just because that's easy and just because we can, what is actually really happening here? What is the thing that's going on? And going back to your TED talk, the way you were able to build those blocks through, so starting with that really powerful first statement and building those blocks through, when we step back, we can think, actually, it isn't just about my emotional experience. My dog has one too. And we discussed in the last uh, Beyond the Opera about the term alignment, which mm -hmm. you know, we talked about. And I think that's what we're all trying to seek, isn't it? Some alignment mm -hmm. uh, in that process about our, those human needs. A lot of them are quite fragile human needs and uh, we can't dismiss those, of course, right. because we have them, right? Uh, but also we've got to start factoring in the dog more and asking more about the why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like, you know, I've, I've really been wrestling um, lately with and just kind of exploring my own thoughts about it and perspectives about like, gosh, it's crazy how we've ended up in this spot so suddenly in a way about dogs after so many thousands of years of like not having dog trainers. And I think your average person anyway, not necessarily relating to them as um, something that needs to obey, not really having any expectations that they would obey our every whim. Not to say that there isn't a contradiction there because historically, I think you, one could make the case that humans treated dogs much worse, right? That we probably didn't think they had any feelings at all. You know, modern science hadn't shed a lot of light on that for us yet. So maybe humans for the longest time felt entitled to treat them um, less than because of concepts of dominion and um, the idea that it's like the master and the hound, but you know, I, I think that at the same time, it was somehow calibrated with an understanding that it's also an animal. And it's weird because it's almost like we flipped where it's like, so now everyone, all people who share their life with a dog in modern industrialized developed countries have this kind of pet set of expectations as if literally their purpose for being is to obey our every whim and meet our emotional and, you know, uh, lifestyle needs, you know, the way that we f envision and fantasize about that. And uh, that part is really new, you know, the, the part about um, how it, it, ironically people before had thought of them as, well, you know, they will bite you if you go and you touch them when they have a bone or let sleeping dogs lie, like all these kind of cultural idioms where we just kind of understood, well, you know, it's an animal and it is part of the natural world and they're going to respond this way to this and that. Like that weird common sense piece that I think was there for thousands of years, we've suddenly lost that. It's literally like they're animated stuffed animals, you know, in our mind that are products that are created like my cell phone, you know, like any other modern convenience appliance or, you know, piece of furniture or whatever, but like it's made for us. We can custom order it, the color, the type of hair, whether it sheds or not, the size, whatever, the way that we want. And we are so completely divorced from the very real history of how they fit into human lives for thousands of years. 
um, the way that they've worked so closely with us, the way that we develop them to work in all these really distinctly different jobs and roles, such that we changed their very being, right? Like we played God with who they were as a species and broke them into all these subspecies to make them instruments for our efforts. And, you know, again, I'm not saying all of that is bad. A lot of it was really functional. And a lot of it ended up being these pretty symbiotic, you know, win-wins where, you know, it was easier on a survival level for those dogs. And it was definitely easier for us. And we kind of shared that success as we, you know, took on agriculture and hunting um, in new ways because of the benefit of theirs. But now, it's like, okay, so we've evolved in the one way, right? Like we've realized they have feelings and they're, it's not just a utilitarian thing and we want to keep them safe like we would our children and we love them. Like we're kind of in this weird paradox, right? Ourselves with them psychologically. Because I would argue humans have also never loved their dogs more than they do now. I think we care for them like family members and will you know, the pet industry hasn't taken a hit while all these other industries keep going through these ups and downs because we will spend for our dogs when we don't spend for ourselves. And yet these new but powerful narratives about the pet dog's role in our life and obedience training for the modern pet and dominance and compliance and commands, like there, there was a pitch that got started maybe 40 years ago that just took hold. And we loved the idea that, oh, it's okay to expect the dog to do everything that I want it to do. So it's just a matter of how I'm going to make it do those things. And then we, we completely lost touch with the reality from the thousands of years prior and the fact that dogs are actually a species that's part of the natural world and, you know, going to be affected by the natural laws. So it's almost like we've had this weird flip. And now we have to get the alignment, as you say, we've got to like rebalance it and figure out, oh, okay, how can we integrate what we've evolved that's good in our understanding? And how can we dispel the stuff that's really useless? It's trash, it's, you know, it's just not reality and it's not helping dogs or us, frankly. And then how can we then evolve? How can we move forward from here? What do we want to take? What do we want to leave? You know, um, and, and you're right. The excitement in the industry of just so many people that have said, oh my gosh, I've been thinking this way and feeling this way. I've been writing this way, but I felt like I'm out here on a limb by myself. And all of a sudden we're all finding ourselves, you know, collecting and conversing around this awesome, huge trunk of a tree where it's like, this can be the center of the conversation. It's an amazing moment. Yeah, and uh, um, I just want to unpack a couple of things you said there because there's a few things you said um, that are really profound when we when we do step back and think because <clears throat> excuse me because you're right there's something's happened in this last forty years right or oh, thereabouts and um, I think we can make some connections here between um, the uh, complications uh, of our own care needs uh, as we've kind of gone through this crazy spell in human history with the development on and changes in our societal model which has left us to have even more of our own care needs are unmet yeah uh, whilst at the same time we've been um, had this new era of dog ownership which mm -hmm. has got a different angle to it but which was looking back pitched at the wrong angle because it was pitched very much around all the kind of language that we have obedience <clears throat> dominance um uh, all the kind of things that we're kind of have been led to believe has to be there as part of that training model mm -hmm. so it's no wonder we've got this conflict then because we uh, i think part of it is we've got these huge expectations now on our companion animal based on the the kind of frailties of our own emotional needs now mm -hmm built upon a really rocky foundation of this notion of what they're expected to do and what they what, what we need them to do. And, and again, going back to your TED talk, you really referenced that really well. <clears throat> and uh, so this thing about alignment again, realign, or align, yeah, realignment, alignment is important because the things that we're talking about now, and you're right, there's lots more people coming forwards and saying, I've been having those feelings or I've been uh, you know, thinking about those thoughts. We have to somehow shift that balance to get it more equitable mm -hmm. before we can start moving in a different direction because I do feel uh this is going to sound a bit controversial maybe but I'll say anyway why not um I do think that the, the training 
model that we've had has, has kind of sold us a lie. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, and the caregiver following these things that they learn early on about, you know, the obedience side of things, especially and, and what the dog's supposed to do. Um, a lot of these things are, are not attainable for them. Mm -hmm. So they feel that, like you said in the in the TED talk, that they've they've got a dud. Right. That the dogs the dog can't do it. So they're, they're, there's something wrong with the dog, or they take it personally themselves. There's something wrong with them as a caregiver. They can't do it right. Right. Um, and underpinning all this, of course, is the huge explosion in the last forty or fifty years of consumerism and yeah. uh, the collection of stuff. And the expectations around what that stuff is and what it should do and what it should be. So I think it's, it's quite a melting pot, isn't it, Kim? Yeah, I mean, it, right? It's it's funny because I like years ago came up with this idea of dog in the coal mine, like they're an indicator species for us, <laughs> right? And like, oh no, the dogs are suffering. We should look at humanity and what's actually happening to us because they're they're showing us where we're headed. But um, you know, you're right. I mean, there's so many complicated things caught up in the dog phenomenon. You know, our our need for control. Our, um, our, our own separation from our roots evolutionarily, you know, naturally in terms of, um, you know, even things like you stop and think about something as basic for dogs and for us about like needing to exercise, right? When like forever, for every species, <laughs> exercise was just part of survival. So you didn't need to arbitrarily like go to a gym or like run the dog or throw the ball. And how weird is it that in such a short period of time, you know, in a century, we've found ourselves in a place where the thousands of years that came before feel like something we don't even recognize, you know, where our reality is so mm -hmm. contrived and indoors and sedentary and restricted and controlled in general. And, and then so it, it seems when everything in marketing, whatever the product be, even unrelated to dogs, is telling us, you have a problem, we have a solution. Our product will save the day. It'll fix blah, 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 blah. You can have everything you want and you deserve everything you want. And if you want a dog to comply to every one of your commands, then we can make that happen. It's like, so everything in marketing in a way is about all these lies. And we all kind of know that. But actually, this is a really good example too of how I think that training can be part of the lie and it can be very manipulative. And it can be an example of how we or dogs can be conditioned to have ideas and responses that don't fit who we actually are or what we want or what works for us. Like we all are conditioned through marketing against our will because of the operant model and how absolutely true operant conditioning and classical conditioning, the model of behaviorism applied behavior analysis is. That is legit and it's happening all the time to all of us and dogs. But marketing experts, know how to use ABA and behaviorism as well as the best dog behavior practitioner out there who understands ABA inside and out in order to manipulate and change our behavior against our will. And so even though it works, right? Like we would make the case, oh, my training is very effective. Look at the results that I'm getting and the changes in the dog's behavior to get the outcome that I'm wanting. But is it good for me that, you know, I have all those marketing messages in my head? Is it good for my 14 year old daughter that she has all those marketing messages in her head? Is it good for our dogs that they feel this obligation to follow us around and go and do a downstay at our feet because we trained them to do that as an expectation we've conditioned? But is that actually functional for the dog? Is it good for their well being? You know, and, um, and, and I think a lot of it is just kind of the modern phenomenon mess that we've all found ourselves in and the momentum is so powerful none of us know how to turn it all back right like eo wilson called this out you know in the early 20th century in his book biophilia about the machine antipode and humans moving away from their evolutionary natural roots and towards this idea of like the mechanics and what we can control and kind of making this plastic reality for ourselves and frankly we brought dogs along with us for that ride right because they were already our sidekick and it worked it was an easy niche for the pet industry to come in and say, you have the perfect food, the perfect program, the perfect veterinarian, the perfect supplement, the perfect whatever, then you will have the perfect dog. And of course, breeders 
not all of them, but most of them have done, as I said in the talk, a little to dispel that myth because they're selling a product. So they, ha they have a conflict of interest because truth is not what sells puppies. They will fill whatever demand is out there. And dogs have become products instead of companions um, in the truest sense of the word. So that means they are just now, sadly, part of that whole marketing pitch. And I think as a professional, I can speak for myself coming into the dog training world. I felt like my job is to deliver the product of your desired behavior change to you for your dog at the beginning of my career. And the sense of failure I have, if someone comes in and it's like, well, he's still doing the thing I don't want him to do. When did we decide that it was realistic for us to come in and manipulate a relationship in an individual against their own will with where one individual's interest is the heart and core of our purpose in that job and the other one, well, that you know their interests don't matter. It's like we were serving the people, not serving the dog. And as much as we all love dogs, those of us who are in this industry, it's like it's in our subconscious. We've known this, we've felt it, we've seen it, you know? Um, but it, we haven't been able to break outside the narrative that makes us feel as trainers kind of like privately embarrassed that we didn't mm. fix it, you know? <clears throat> yeah, and I think this is the thing that I've talked about, about the difference between moving on and moving forward. We've definitely moved on, for mm -hmm. sure, you know, um, but we are still... <clears throat> kind of doing so, some of the same things but we're just doing it nicer right? right moving forward is just having a wider view and, and none of this discussion uh of anybody uh for those are listening is about us saying we don't train we shouldn't train um yeah. <clears throat> it's about thinking about when we step back and look societally especially for caregivers the vast majority of caregivers uh, owners want to be the best caregiver they love their dogs they want to do the right thing by their by their their family member mm -hmm. but how much of that view of what that dog is mm -hmm. as a being as an individual uh, let alone being a labrador or a dog but as an individual right, right. Uh, and how much of their expectations and how much of the frustrations and complications are because societally we've set people on the wrong track from mm -hmm. the start because it is uh, one that has this kind of notion of, of control and coercion. But having said that, Kim, you know, we could be having the same conversation now. I spoke to a, a colleague of mine a couple of weeks ago who's an educational psychologist dealing with, uh, specializing in uh, young people who have real communication challenges. So they might not be able to talk freely or they might not be able to kind of uh, process freely. Uh, and we could be having the same conversation about children, right? I think when Absolutely. we think, look at it societally, how we've shifted, um, but there are still expectations on a child and their behavior. And this is the thing about alignment again, because um, it's not about giving children, dogs, any, anybody really uh, kind of free reign to do anything they like, which mm -hmm. is what gets thrown back at us, right? Oh yeah, well, you're just gonna, yeah, how, how are you gonna do this? But right. it's the case of trying to think about the core emotionality of that animal, their emotional experience, which is included in this whole package. And, and actually a lot of the things that we have to train out because it becomes a problematic behavior would probably have been avoided if we'd have given that dog in the early months, more freedom and more chance to explore and more chance to kind of internalize uh, learning from a ex experimental way rather than all the structured learning that we throw at them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just um, making a note here about, um, you know, it's this contradiction we've talked about before of, okay, so I think this is important to address because as you say, there's this kind of like response that we're getting of what, so you're just not going to train them and let them do whatever. I will tell y'all, I am the least along that line of thinking that just let dogs do whatever. And frankly, I'm that person who hates the parenting model where you don't ever say no to your children. I think it's crazy. I think they need parameters. I think all social animals come into a social group from an ethological lens going, how does it work? 
I'm a juvenile. I'm a child. I'm, I'm a dependent, right? That's, that's the role. That's the lot dogs have genetically and, and environmentally because we have genetically domesticated them. So neoteny is par for the course on different lens, uh, levels and spectrums throughout their species. They're dependent genetically. So freeing the puppies and not having any rules at all is not going to help them. They would be like lost and have little clue to know what to do, at least most of the domesticated modern breeds. You go to third world countries and you talk about how nature's still breeding them, totally different story. But especially the American pet dog lines, they're completely dependent genetically. Environmentally, now they're completely captive and they are dependent on us. And so we actually can't just say, do absolutely whatever you want because they are now in our human world exclusively. So then we are responsible, like a parent would be, to say, let me show you how this works. Let me help you. Because there is a certain alignment that needs to happen where it's like, you cannot jump all over grandma when she comes in the door because you weigh 140 pounds and I love my mom and I don't want to watch her crack her head open on the pavement. So these things, just like before raising a child, we have to say, these are things that are appropriate. These are things that aren't appropriate. And yes, all of that involves some level of judgment. Frankly, any social structure does in any species, even within other species, they're going to say, these are the rules. You're not following the rules. So I'm going to correct you for not following the rules, you know, and, but yet the social alliance value and the support that you get when you get on board with the social culture, if you will, whether that's a like group of two or a group of a hundred, it's not about like, I need to control you. It's about, we will all be more successful if we all have an agreement so going back to that concept of alignment about how things operate, the do's and the don'ts, getting on the same page. And you don't have to actually like manipulate in a contrived way another's behavior in order to do that. It comes back to feedback and communication and validation and information. So I want dogs to understand that like I have information for you that can make your life go much better. And I will give you gentle feedback about awesome, you're doing it great. And actually, no, not so much, right? Like that's, we can't really do that. Like that's not an appropriate way to interact with grandma. So we're gonna come over here and take five. We'll try it again in a minute, you know? And that whole idea of being able to educate. And so thinking of it as I'm explaining, not training is something that I really like to focus on. So I'm, I'm showing, not just, commanding what your behavior is and i do think that we have we have a role in that to to help them with it and so i just i want to say that because i understand the fear that some people are saying and i would share that fear if i didn't kind of understand what we are saying that you're all are just suggesting not to train dogs <laughs> that's not at all what we're doing um but i will say the shift is in part not just that how to do it to the why is it happening so that we know what kind of feedback to actually give that would be helpful for that dog's experience. But it's also about instead of us just memorizing, like as if we're learning how to fix washing machines, how to train a dog. And then we go to our clients and we're like, this is how to change behavior. We should all as an industry be learning how to have critical thinking and problem solving so that we can assess in the first place what needs to actually change. Um, small case in point example, and I just posted in on our um, Legs Applied Ethology course group Facebook page. Um, I had a client who sent me a picture yesterday of her little Scottish Terrier. Her homework was to buy him a vest that was somehow hilariously and kind of cutely saying, don't touch me or I'll bite you. Because this dog is the very definition of appropriate, minds his own business, goes on the walks, doesn't bother the neighbors. And no matter how many times they tell the neighbors, don't pet him, he doesn't like being pet by strangers. They have neighbors that will keep petting him and shocker, he bites them when unsolicited, just like I'm talking about in the TED talk, someone comes up and pets him and he doesn't know them. He's like, get your mitts off me, buddy. You're a stranger. Why are you stroking me? This is super awkward. And he's got a huge mouth and big teeth. And so he's landed a few bites, but he is not a dog who would bother anybody. So they got him a little vest. Instead of me saying, train him to tolerate being pet by strangers, which is kind of the old model. We have to fix him and make him liking being touched by strangers. I said, get him the vest. So she gets him this adorable vest that says, um, I'm a bit of a twat. <laughs> Don't pet me. <laughs> 
And while he's not actually a twat, job done, right? Because people will have a giggle and they'll keep their hands to themselves. And so looking at things like that, right? Is dog training what we even need to be doing in the first place? Is this a matter of explaining it to the dog or is it really a matter of being clearer with the people? And again, loads to unpack even uh, for more of that as well, because when there's, there's two ways that we have to see this, in my opinion. The, the first is what we have now. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, because the real the real situation is that the the zeitgeist, the norm is still a lot of carers viewing their dogs in a certain way, um, uh, more of a traditional outlook. Uh, and dogs from a, the very moment they come into the human environment, having that really heavy emphasis on structured learning. Mm -hmm. A lot of that learning will have absolutely no internal value to that dog. It's just because mm -hmm. they've got to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing we've got to recognize. And that's difficult for us because uh, when we go and see a client and their dog, we're already inheriting all that. Mm -hmm. so we have to think about. It's a good way to say that. Mm -hmm. The other thing, the other side of this is, okay, so we kind of know that. And this is why these discussions are so important because, okay, that's there. But what is this future look like? What is the, what is a different vision? How do we change that? I saw some amazing on, um, no, it was on Radio 4 over here. I listened to it on Radio 4. And um, they had a lady who, He's bringing up her child in, in a very free way so the child can express themselves emotionally, uh, a lot of experimental learning. Um, and one of the other people on the panel said, look, you're doing your child a disservice because that's not reality. This isn't real life. You know, when, when she grows up, this is the adult world. And the lady said to, back to that person, but it depends how we're going to look at this. We can either take your view that somehow my efforts are going to be uh, a waste of time because that is the structure that my child's going to go come into mm -hmm. or we think well maybe the problem is the structure in the first place mm -hmm. maybe this is the problem mm -hmm. not what I'm trying to see and I think it's a similar yeah. with the dogs and I think um uh with us thinking as an industry about how do we create more input from the dog, create more agency, how do we allow more experimental learning? Um, Scott from uh, Effective Dog Behaviour, he talks a lot about seeking connections and that social connection. And I think that's important because when we think about some of the things you were talking about a minute uh, 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 earlier about how we can offer the dog uh, direction and connection through mm -hmm. our education, Mm -hmm. that, so it can have internal value so mm -hmm. when we're thinking about rover and grand coming and not jumping up when we think about the reality for the dog and where that jumping up is coming from and what can we do to add internal value so you can still get that connection you seek mm -hmm. but without knocking granny over in the process <laughs> right. now we're getting alignment right 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 uh, yeah <laughs> and I, I think it's one of the reasons why all my dogs goose people is because I've <laughs> accidentally facilitated that as like an appropriate alternative to jumping because that kind of ramming their head between your legs and standing there while you're rubbing them. It's like, it's so satisfying to many dogs. And I, you know, I didn't realize it for a while till I was like on my fifth dog that goose people. And I was like, well, I've done that, but I don't care. Right. Because like, and they're not doing huge crotch sniffing and like all sorts of invasive stuff, but just like, if they want to connect just kind of putting their head against someone's knees you know and not being pushy about it like as a wonderful yeah. alternative like see that's so sweet and people like that and it feels meaningful and connective and you're not knocking grandma over and uh, that, what's good about that is it's that 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 middle ground that safe Mm -hmm. a way for the dog to connect socially which is mm -hmm. great <clears throat> uh, and also it's an invitation for the human to connect you know with my with my labrador you know he uh, anybody who met harley would think that he loves people but he's actually quite sensitive uh, socially dogs or people but he'll come over and he'll grab his toys labrador right but he'll bring it over and uh, he doesn't want you to have it he doesn't want to share it with you. It's just a really good way for him to find a safe way to have some kind of social engagement. And when we think about the psychology regarding social processing, social engagement, we, we need to talk more about that and, and investigate that more because uh, you know from an ethology point of view how much the brain has connected to that process, how important it is. Social threat evaluation, we take it so much for granted now. You know, I, you know, I could go in the good old days to see a client and they'd let me in their house and I'd sit down and have a cup of tea. There's a lot of stuff that's gone on for the brain to allow that to happen. And we've kind yeah. of bypassed some of that process. But even we, when we do a lot of that processing subconsciously, <clears throat> of course, if you are 
more reserved person, you will be more aware of that threat evaluation process. It'll be more right. confident, right? But even us, we can think, oh, there's something about Kim that I'm not quite sure about, even though mm -hmm. she's been really nice. And that's that process. And our dogs will invariably, you know, Kathy Murphy will tell us, will have a similar neurological process about these things. A lot of the time, these dogs who are jumping at people or are, are being having a, like a silly fun response or are being grumpy to other dogs it's not necessarily about the person or the dog I feel it's because that social processing process that they need to go in our world doesn't let them play out because social engagement is thrown on them so quickly right well and and I so let's I have two points there hopefully I won't lose my thoughts so the first one is that the the expectation that we have and i think this is part of the old stuff that's brought along from the past and then the pet marketing industry just hasn't dispelled it yet the cultural idea is still the dogs are really dumb so you know what i mean and i'm not picking on the clients who say this and even the professionals that continue to kind of accidentally endorse this just because we we're all taught it but right the idea that well, why does, why is he growling at that person? He likes people. Or why is he growling at that dog? He likes dogs. It's like, when did we ever get the idea that dogs, if you introduce them to a half a dozen people and they give them cookie, give them cookies are just going to like everybody. Like on what planet is that realistic that anyone likes everything? And then again, that subconscious pervasive thinking of like, we can control it. I can control your emotions and your perceptions by doing A, B, and C. And, and the accidental arrogance in that, right? Not that anyone means it, but that's the narrative that stuck is that, yeah, if you just do this and this and this, everything will be fine. So people will say, well, it doesn't make any sense because I socialized him and blah, 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 and blah, 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 but he just doesn't like these people that have come in, but he's met 30 other people since he was a puppy. And it's like, again, I go back to that idea that I've said before, how would I feel or how would you feel is a scientific question to ask, right? Because our brains are actually processing information in very similar ways to dogs. So to say, well, how would I feel if someone I never knew came into the house? And so even though I've already got 20 human friends that I've known since I was a puppy, this is the first new person that's been coming over to our house and I don't know them and their body language is actually kind of weird and they seem a little scared of me. And I don't know how I feel about this. Like, that makes total sense. And, you know, the, the other thing that what you said made me think about is um, the idea of helping processing instead of training to do or not to do. This is one of the reasons I will emphasize again why it is so important for people to talk to their dogs. They have a remarkable receptive language ability. We all know this, like anecdotally. I mean, we all know that like we all teach our dogs funny little phrases and then we say, watch, I'll say this and then he'll go get the whatever or he'll go over to the other person or he'll run to his leash when we say, would you like to go for a walk, right? Lots of people have to spell things these days because the dogs have fi figured out those phrases. We all know that, but why do we stop there? We feel embarrassed to talk to our dogs like they can understand anything we're saying in front of other people because culturally that's like frowned upon, like you're being so weird, you're talking to your dog. But I have found that's the game changing piece for me. Instead of commands, it's information. Mm -hmm. So like a second ago, just personal example, my girl was outside the back door, just maybe 10 feet away here, standing on the back porch barking at something that she smelled. And I was about to start with you. So I walked out there and I didn't say to her, hush, come in the house, sit, all done, anything like that. What I said was, hey, Casey, I'm about to get on the phone. Mommy's working. So I need you to either go down into the yard and bark at the thing or come in the house with me. But you can't just sit here and bark. Now, I know that sounds completely crazy, right? And yes, I'm way more verbose about it with her because she's been raised this way. And so like, what people would call noise in traditional ABC kind of training, like that's confusing the dog because we have such an understanding about information. So I can say either go out into the yard and she knows what that means or come into the house, mommy's working. She knows what each of those little components of phrases mean. She turned around and walked into the house and came down and you know laid down under the desk next to me. And so why have we felt so uncomfortable about the idea that just like raising a toddler, if we know cognitively their brains are very similar to toddlers, why do we not teach people to talk to their dogs more in that idea of 
you're responsible for showing them how this thing works in this modern pet situation. They don't have a lot of genetic points of reference. Frankly, we don't either for the level of captivity we're experiencing in our own lives, but we are the only one who can be an anchor for them and a touchstone in that, you know, and it's our job. And that's uh, what you described there is this whole thing about experimental learning and how powerful that is because it's more likely to have internal value. We can all share similar stories with our dogs about, um, like say, if I say these kind of things or if I do this or if I put these together, my dog will that. These aren't things that we've trained in a structured way. They're things that yeah. the dog has in, added internal value through Figured experimental out. learning and connection, that kind of social connection with us. Uh, and it's really important. I always invite people to think back to um, when they were at school, mm -hmm. that structured learning process. They will not remember much about the structured learning. They will remember a lot about the experimental learning. And actually what you were talking about a moment ago about social pressures that dogs feel under and those expectations and um, and especially what we tend to do in those early socialization classes, I uh, do that, I don't like the word socialization mm -hmm. much, but, but um, when you think back to those kids, you know, we, we don't even do much social stuff in the school setting, we have playtime and we have things like that, most of it's about that structured learning, but how many of us, and I would class myself here, I went through a really awkward social stage when I was going through my education, uh, and there was no exit, there was no escape, um, uh, my own social frailties were just staring me in the face because I didn't have enough time to process and be able to make those choices that I need to do to feel safe. We can all remember those times. Uh, and this is something on a very kind of connected level, right? Because it's, it's not a conscious thing where we're thinking about it. It's just how we, how we feel, how we connect. Right. That. <clears throat> yeah. And I think the more we can think about experimental learning, you know, um, uh, and there's so many people looking at these things. You know, Sheila Harper has been talking about this for a long time. Of, of course, um, Turid and Linda Rugas, mm -hmm. um, uh, the slow dog movement over here in the UK, Laura Dobb. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and this notion of just slowing stuff down and seeing how the dog processes, trying not to make too many judgment calls and trying to kind of dive in. Mm -hmm. um, but this is that generational shift, Kim. You know, I don't do puppy classes, but I, I do I do one to one. So I, I, I have that luxury, I guess. But having said that, I've got colleagues over here in the UK and, and one of them's going to come into the group soon to talk about the amazing thing she's doing as part of a class environment, mm -hmm. which is taking the rule book and throwing it out the window and it's amazing it's inspiring and getting great results but on a one-to-one -one level um i need to learn from that puppy first and we've got to kind of work things through we've got to find out how that puppy's connecting look for those individual things a lot of stuff as, as you've talked about that puppy's got innately mm -hmm. yeah mother nature's pretty good at giving us what we need at the right time right during our development yeah. right right um <clears throat> and uh so as a caregiver we should be um I always see us a little bit, you know, when you go bowling, 10 temp temping bowling, and you've got those rubber rings down the side to stop the mm -hmm. ball coming out. I kind of see that as us, right? Uh, but we've got to let the dog play the game a little bit and, and not yeah. be too, where is that? Uh, and it's the same again, we bring up kids. Uh, it's the same sort of I, thing. I, I was just going to say, that is a perfect analogy for what I was going to share about like my own parenting experience is like, this is why I'm not saying don't teach, do nothing, let them do whatever. Like boundaries do make them feel safe, right? If they have nothing to bounce off of, off of, they become more dysfunctionally anxious, especially as a dependent, right? Because their their whole thing is like, is there a parent in the room? And, and you know, in the way I, I use this example, if you travel to another country and you didn't know how the culture worked, you didn't understand like the language and how to operate on your own autonomy, you did not have those resources, right? So you're in that dependent position. You're terrified, like if you land in that airport and your tour guide doesn't show up and you're like, I have no idea what to do. Like, that's a panicky feeling. That's not fun. So that kind of freedom is not the kind of thing I, I'm talking about. You know, when that tour guide shows up and is like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the plan. Here's how this works. Let me help you. Let me show you. That's like the bumpers in the bowling. Like, so yeah, but what about this? Oh, okay, Miss Brophy, this is how this works. Oh, but what about this? Oh, Miss Brophy, this is how this works. That's why I like the explanations model 
and the kind of, you know, that individual has the ability to take initiative towards the circumstances that I don't have the ability to take initiative towards certain circumstances. They know how to flag our transportation down. It was a different cultural dynamic there than what I might be doing here in the United States, right? And if I don't know how to operate within those circumstances, being asked or burdened to operate within them without the guidance and the information is horrifying. So like the way I raised my kids, was that kind of feedback model, right? Like there are things that you might want to do that seem appropriate to you as a six-year-old or seven-year-old or an eight-year-old boy in your classroom that are not gonna be functional and will actually cause harm to others, which is another part of social education is as a social animal, your behavior has ripple effects on others. And we also have to respect them and their feelings. So it's not just your feelings matter, do whatever you want, or that mine matter and I can do whatever I want. It's that we're within a culture, within a society. And so there are some agreements about like when he was in class, my son, who was, he, my son is the very definition of like, <laughs> huge personality in the room, wonderful critical thinking, sees all the inconsistencies and in what people are doing, was never scared of authority. And so like I got calls from every teacher every year of his life, even if he was a straight A student, we got lots of phone calls from things like, so your son in the second grade today decided to put his lunchbox on his head, put his legs through the back of his chair and walk to the bathroom dragging his chair while the rest of the class was listening to the teacher because he had already finished the assignment. He already understood it. He was bored basically is why it happened. Um, and so for him, it was just amusing. You know, it was like entertainment. He's a little kid trying to figure out where are the lines, right? And so having to say to him as his mom, I get that you're bored. I get that you're a kid. I get that that seemed like a fun, exciting idea. I get that it's reinforcing to have all your friends giggle at you, right? I get all that stuff. But the phrase I used to use with them is even if it is, it feels like baloney to you, right? I still need you to swing at that baloney. You just got to play ball with the baloney, even if it is baloney and you know it's not a baseball. And it doesn't seem to make any sense to you why you should have to sit still in that desk for another 45 minutes as an eight year old boy. And you're right, it's kind of bullshit that they're making you sit still That's in that fair. desk as an eight year old boy. This is how it works. The other kids who can't figure it out as quickly as you can need to focus on the teacher. And when you walk with a chair dragging behind your butt all the way to the bathroom, that distracts them from their learning and that's not fair to them, right? And so it's the whole idea of help it make sense. And with dogs, obviously I can't be that verbose about it, right? But like the idea of the boundaries are there for everyone's shared interest. That's how I look about it. Like boundaries are healthy. They're good for agreements. All relationships need them in some way, shape or form. And that's my job. Healthy boundaries and establishment of that, not the idea of just the compliance. And I love your dog center care model because it asks all those questions about like, what's gonna have value to the dog. So in my example, I'm using there, that has value for my son in his life to learn. Yeah, you can't just push it up against everything and do whatever you want. You're going to end up alone and miserable and dysfunctional in the world if you can't work with others and different contexts. Um, and so for dogs, it's less complicated, but the same. And that I'm trying to give you the life skills you need to be able to operate, operate successfully in the conditions that you're going to encounter in your life. I'm trying to prepare you. I'm trying to help you. And what's really good about <clears throat> that example as well is when we start thinking about structured learning versus uh, experimental learning. Uh, this shows the conflict and tension that is created in structured learning. So your son, that expression of his, his self, his identity, mm -hmm. became inappropriate because he's within a structured educational setting. And mm -hmm. uh, one of my clients is, um, he's a teacher for uh, a quite a big comprehensive school, but he, he works with the, with the kids who are struggling a little bit. Uh, and he says, he's told me that he has to face this tension and conflict all the time mm -hmm. because um, you know, they have their care needs, they have those outlooks, they have those, that emotional experience, that learning style. Uh, and he's trying to get that square peg in a round hole to work. And interestingly, this is quite uh, a kind of um, uh, a phenomenon for many in the developed world. When we think about, uh, when I was talking to that, my colleague who's the educational psychologist looking at um, uh, countries where 
actually the education isn't the first thing that's a, it's an add-on mm -hmm. actually the children uh, have more access to experimental learning they're more mm -hmm. connected they're connected to village life they're connected to family uh, they're connected to social role modeling and um uh, and connected learning uh, mm -hmm. And then they really enjoy the structured learning because it's an extra. And the structured mm -hmm. learning is something that's been provided because they can now do that. Mm -hmm. In our society, structured learning is everything we need. And what you were talking about a moment ago about all the things that we have to also learn about social need, the psychology of self-care. Every generation asks the question, why don't we teach that in schools? And the sad reality, um, without being too cynical, is because the political classes don't care about that. Mm -hmm. that you know the structured learning is about uh as having a school system that provides the next doctors nurses bin men whatever mm -hmm. you know that, that what society needs from that process so again when we step back we have to think about what we're actually having that that kind of feeds into all this even feeding into our view of dogs we're already conditioned very early about a structured educational model about expectations mm -hmm on our behavior on what results mean. You know, for some people, the fact they get through a school day is a result, right? But the right. fact they haven't got a, an A plus on the piece of paper means somehow they are less than. Right. Uh, so it fits then, it's very easy because we don't have to challenge our thought process to think, same for my dog, you know, mm -hmm. I've got to be able to attain that good citizen scheme for my dog to have any worth, or I, I need to be able to, do that certain type of training and have that kind of output because we're already kind of conditioned for it many of us some people aren't of course and um you know some people have have had uh, homeschooling or we've got the mm -hmm. forest school system over here i don't know if you've got that over there which is more about the child having more agency and more connection mm -hmm. to their learning process mm -hmm. to unpack there i think it, it uh, goes back to what you were saying at the beginning too about um the brain right and the expectations and and how you know everything we've been talking with kathy so much about is that like the brain wants the solidity of a belief system and the expectations and the predictability of systems i mean if you look at like human behavior too it's complicated as we are I mean, all the different cultures and cultural norms and religious norms and expectations and prescriptions. It's like the brain is just dying to create order out of the chaos, it seems, you know, in a world yeah. that's very overwhelming and complicated <clears throat> and changing. We want to kind of find patterns. We feel more confident and relaxed and assured when it feels like, okay, I know what to do. I know how this works. That feels reinforcing for us and it feels like solidifying even if it's not true. And so we have to kind of compassionately navigate the phenomenon of our own brain function and biases and the fact that we are kind of um, primed to default to those oversimplistic perspectives on things and that that's okay. And we're not horrible people, right? For having missed it till now. And I, I think that's really important to say too, is I'm not beating up dog families. I'm not beating up dog professionals. I'm not saying, oh my gosh, this is so horrible. All these people are doing it wrong. I'm saying, wow, we got really lost in the weeds. <laughs> yep. Let's find our way out, you know, together. I love that. We we have got a bit lost. And I think these conversations, uh, I, I, I try to myself when, I, when I'm giving my own little talks and things, uh, is invite people to find their own truth through some of this. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, and again, coming to that term alignment, I think we can all, if we're honest and just step back, think, yeah, actually we do need to tip the balance a little bit to be a little bit more equitable. Mm -hmm. And we could probably say the same in our family unit, actually, yeah. with our work colleague. There's, there's lots of areas where we need to. The talk I gave last night um, about judgments and, and belief systems and that kind of thing, it is important because that is what, what we have and the brain doesn't like to do things in a very complicated way so that's why we have all these type of cognitive biases because they are shortcuts the brain's like i don't i, I don't want to have to cognitively reappraise this i just need right. to fix my belief system so we need to educate more about this because it's important for us because we have to think right hang on a minute i need to maybe that's why i create that cake acronym Yep. Uh, compassion, awareness, knowledge, and empathy, because in order for me, when I get into a situation to try and check my own belief system and to check my own judgment and bias, I need to start with compassion. I need to get, that's a good way to kind mm. of bypass some of those. But also we need to know about these principles because the people we will we'll be talking to will have that structure. Mm -hmm. Now, because our brain wants to dive straight in, 
we're, it's really easy to get into friction and conflict because their belief system doesn't match mine. And we see this in politics, right? We see this with Brexit and Trump and, and whatever else. And what happens is unless we are aware of those, that process, that function, we end up polarizing. Right. That's what's happened in the dog industry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I genuinely think myself, the emotional experience is the way forward as in how we need to frame things. We've got to learn about how we communicate that and how we learn more about it. But the emotional experience, we all have one. Really important, we all have one. And most importantly, they're all unique to us. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're working with caregivers to start framing and referencing that emotional experience is better, I think, for best outcomes rather than just turning up and arbitrary, it's the arbitrarily, arbitrary, ar sorry, arbitrary nature of some of the things we've done traditionally which is the problem actually not the training as such it's just the i'm going to show you how we're going to change that behavior because we the human have decided it's not right yeah without recognizing the emotional experience that lay behind it and a lot of our caregivers when they hear this that we're still feeding into that belief system that somehow their dog's behavior is bad and this is why I propose family dog mediation instead of dog training. I think yeah. dog training in itself is the wrong idea. I think as long as we keep saying that's what we're here for, that's what my company is, that's what I do, that's my job, that's my role, then it keeps fostering the wrong subsequent implication ripple ideas and thinking about train it, program it, fix it, right? So yes, I train dogs, right? We all train dogs. But then it's like, that's a tool we pick up and put down the training part, right? So at, at the heart of it, we should be mediators between two species. At the heart of it, we should like a mediator's job isn't to go through this prescriptive process. A mediator's job is to say, you tell me what your needs and concerns and goals are. You tell me what your needs and concerns and goals are. Let me help you guys find the middle ground, which is why I named the book, Meet Your Dog. It's you meet them in the middle, right? Like it's this compromise and this relationship dynamic where everybody gets to matter. And I'd never heard you talk about your cake analogy, but I just have to tell you, I love it because it fits really well with something that I've been saying for a long time, which is you can't put icing on a cake that's not there unless you just end up with a bunch of shit all over the floor. So that's what dog training is to me. We put, we forget the cake, it's falling apart. It's like got no, you know, substantial, um, support to it, no integrity to its structure. And here we are putting icing all over it. Oh, look at the pretty little sit down, stay in the spin and the come and the blah, 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 blah. But then what if the dog is coming apart at the seams underneath all that? You know, it's kind of like repainting your house and doing all this fancy landscaping and making everything look really awesome. But like the, the plumbing and the electric and the foundation are just completely going to heck. And mm. so it's, it's that idea, right? That like cake first. And that's why I like family dog mediation first. And then, oh, we need to teach something great. I have a pocket of skills called dog training that I pick up and I employ for that part. And then we put that down. But your homework might also be to get that vest for your dog that says my dog's a twat, don't touch him just for his benefit and your benefit, put the onus on the people that are doing it wrong and make sure that they're not petting him, you know, because that's not a dog training issue in that particular case. He's not doing anything wrong. I think that's right. And I love your term, you, how you've introduced the term mediator, mediation uh, to this process, because that's kind of what it is, right? Um, uh, and coming back to that alignment thing again, it's finding that kind of middle ground because that's where you that's where you build the best foundations, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, for our colleagues listening who are passionate about trying to do things in a more humane way, trying to do things uh, without the tools and methods that have, we've used in the past, um, the best way, in my opinion, that we really try and get clients to to really have value to that is by starting off with these discussions about the emotional experience and and those those dogs emotional needs because uh, this is why i call it the opera merry-go-round um which is purely about the fact that if we just keep trying to fight these battles purely on methodology methodology and tools we won't actually get anywhere because the reality is going back to those belief systems you've got that client they believe in the dominance model or they they have um you know uh, the kind of 
um, the popular view of what it is a dog should or shouldn't do. We can turn up and we can say, yeah, we're going to do this, but we don't use those tools anymore. We're going to mm -hmm. do this with food. But the reality is there's a good chance that carer is still hearing behavior bad needs to change it. Right. So we haven't necessarily shifted their belief system at all. But if we're going in and supporting their emotional experience, I, I always try and um, educate about the emotional experience in a neutral way. So I never reference the dog. I just say, this is the kind of the emotional experience. Then I can say to the carer, so bear on mind that, tell me how you feel about what's going on with the dog. And then I can say, oh yeah, your bucket's pretty full there, or you haven't got much, many doors open. These are my two kind of knowledge I use a lot about the process and emotional experience. Now I, we can start talking about the dog, right? So it's just that connection. And we can yeah. bypass some of those belief filters. Belief filters are just the cognitive biases that we have that defend our belief system because our belief system is important for the brain to hold on to but if we challenge it too directly those belief filters will kick in those cognitive biases and we're going to shut them off to anything then and, and this is why i think maybe as i'm thinking about it we actually are mediating three parties right we're mediating the dog and the family and culture because at the same time we have to bring in this kind of faceless role of culture and say to the client, hey, this party gave you bad information. And that party didn't do it intentionally. That party didn't have good information to give you, right? And so it's, but that's not your fault because I do think it's important as we start talking about the dog's emotional experience that that weight just doesn't get passed on to the carer. Like you say, like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I've done something wrong. I failed. I didn't know he was feeling that way. I feel so bad. I was for, you know, no, 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 no. I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want you to feel bad at all. I'm trying to help you too. It's not even just helping the dog. It's, fi it's finding our way out of all of this stuff together. Um, and, and I was just thinking a moment ago, I don't know why it popped up, but I was thinking get back to the beginning of the conversation, talking about the TED talk and talking about my experience. I was thinking about how, you know, strange it is and that operant merry-go-round model, like with the narrative that's been dominating the last decade about just use positive methods to accomplish the same compliance. I had this horrible vision of frankly, what is one of the worst parts of my memory, which is what we all think about as that kind of predator behavior of grooming. When we're like, it's okay. I love you. It's okay that I'm doing this thing to you because I love you. And if you do this, then you will get this. And you know, like, that is creepy, nasty stuff. And yet if we don't, we didn't do it intentionally, but a lot of the positive reinforcement stuff is kind of along those lines accidentally of like i will do this wonderful thing for you i know you don't like it but we're you know we're gonna force you to stand still while the person's petting you not and, and we don't think of it as forcing we think of it but it's coercion right so it's like sit wait good wait the man's petting you good wait good job here's a cookie like that's creepy to me you know and i'm not saying that there aren't conditions where we have to say hey we got to go to the doctor to the kid or the dog and the doctor's going to have to do these things it's a little uncomfortable it feels really weird it feels invasive i get that but instead of saying let's brush your experience under the rug and then kind of manipulate and coerce your engagement with that experience let's validate your experience. Yeah, this is uncomfortable. I get it. I really get that it's uncomfortable. It's something that needs to be done. It's for your health and benefit. And, you know, I am your carer. So I've also built up this huge emotional bank account, right? Balance of you trust me. And I don't put you in situations that are against your best interest. And you know that about me. So like, you know, that's a whole other piece we haven't gotten into much, but what does it look like when we have built up that emotional bank account in a relationship to where we can make a little withdrawal? Say, I know you don't like this part, but we got to do this thing. And that brings us quite neatly kind of in a circle really, because um, obviously right at the beginning, we were talking about your your kind of motivation for the initial TED talk. And I, and I think um, we can all relate to times in our lives where we've had to endure for many reasons because the power has been taken from us to be able to disengage, to say no, to give consent or whatever it is. Um, uh, some of us will have had that through kind of genuine trauma uh, and, and, the, and the effects that has on us and our 
belief system and our outlook and how we how we end up moving forward to that. Um, but uh, even um, uh, even on a on a, I was going to say a small level, but every level is it has value, right? So it's not a case of saying that's more than this. But but uh, but but we can all relate to that, and I think that's a really good example about um, why do we this that why again? We totally get the why when. I have to go to the dentist and I really don't want to be there and uh, you know I've had to kind of work with myself to get myself more comfortable and I'd sooner not be there but I've got to be there or the dog in the vets or whatever but that person in the street who comes over and says I need to pet your dog why right but even they the don't need to school, you know even this thing about ask permission and everything else we're not asking the dog's permission I think we've right. been using that advice in schools is to say to kids if it's not your dog or a family member dog don't pet it Right. That's the best thing, surely. Uh, Kim, it's been amazing. We've, um, well, God, we could carry on talking, I know, but um, I'll just have to have you back again. I think I think some of the last few things we've discussed here are things that really need to look at, actually, and unpacking a little bit. And I think that could be something for us to, to look at next time, I think, because, yeah. um, and this is the beautiful thing about this, right? Um, we have, as an industry, been kind of told that the room we're in is it without recognizing the door behind us. Uh, but you know what, when you open that door and you think, oh my God, there's more doors, there's more doors, there's more rooms. There's a whole world out there of different disciplines and different views where we can find our own truths by being able to kind of um, unpick some of those things. I think it's really exciting. Can you yeah. tell people uh, about your wonderful course? If they yeah, I was want just about to say, if you wanna walk through that door behind you in the room that you've been told is all that exists, the course is a great way to do it, you know, and I'm so excited about it because it's like, I'm, I'm not the, the person who has a PhD in all the little kinds of sub scientific disciplines that we will be talking about in the course, but it is that door to all the other doors. It is a door that introduces you to all these other doors and tells you about what's behind that door and walks into that room for a minute and comes back out. And then we sit in the main room again, we go back into another door and we talk about it and we come back out. And for every one of us in that course, there's endless more to find out in those rooms. And I want people to feel a sense of ownership in this. And the whole course is about introducing people to the body of options and all of the things that do affect what we're doing. And then saying, learn more and then bring back what you find and then share your story, experience, insights, ideas, et cetera. So it's collaboration. So the, the Legs Applied Ethology Family Dog Mediation Course is basically your invitation to join the paradigm shift from where I sit. And I hope that that leads to many, many other doors where I can then have people such as you come on and do a specialty sub course that's another one of those doors under that umbrella. And it's a good starting point for us, right? To say, Let's shift. Let's let's say let's evolve from dog training. Let's go into family dog mediation where we're still using our dog training schools, but we just recognize there's more and that it's time to talk about all of it. So people want to find me, they can find me on Facebook. That's probably the fastest, easiest way or our website, uh, Dog Door Canine Services. Your wonderful new website is really lovely website. Uh, what I think I'll do is I'll put those links into the comments on this uh, Facebook Live. Well, Kim, as always, brilliant to see you. Um, we'll Thank be you. getting together again with Kathy to speak to Michael Shikashio in a couple of weeks' time. So that's going to be a real, a real humdinger, I think. And, uh, and thank you for coming into the Dog Centre Care Group. And um, uh, would you like to come back? Of course. Absolutely. Anytime. That was nice and easy. Brilliant. Uh, great. OK, well, thank you to everybody who's listened today. Uh, hopefully... Um, what we're trying to do with this is just to get people to ask some questions and think about things and find their own truths. Like Kim said earlier, we're, we're not trying to be, you must do this or you must do that. It's just a case of, hmm, let's just think about it. Let's just mm -hmm. think about what vision we want for the future because um, uh, we have to think about how we're going to evolve as an industry. We can't, you know, because there are some challenges there and we've got to think about them. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, speak to you soon then, Kim. And thanks to everybody watching um, in Facebook land. Speak to you soon. Mm -hmm.